Okay, it's two. Okay, it's ten minutes up on my clock. You don't have a clock that works on my clock, I'm sure. Although twice a day you do, right? This is a condensation polymer. It's the first, um, I would say, synthetic polymer that we really use a whole lot. Here's the second type. I will tell you what I want from you. What's the goal of a teacher? Anyone he wants, or she, or it, or anyone else. All right, this is called an addition polymer. Oh, that's not a pen that will even stay on this planet for long. There you go. Or this one. Now, this one really is named after the monomer with the word poly in front of it. So first and foremost, this, two carbons. Two carbons is S. Single bond between carbons is ane. So that would be an S ane if it had a single bond of three carbons and three hydrogens would mean the same side. But if it has a double bond, it's an ene. It's ethene, but it's hard for people to say ethene. Ethylene a lot of times is said. This is ethylene. Now, what do we have? When you've got a double bond, you've got four electrons. If you got rid of all four electrons, you wouldn't have a bond. But if you left two electrons, and took two out, you'd have a single bond. It wouldn't break the chain. So here's another ethylene, ethene. Now let me draw the electrons in there. And draw the electrons in there. In chemistry, if we have a double headed arrow, that means two electrons are flying someplace. If we have a single headed arrow, like a fish hook, that means one electron is flying someplace. That's how we draw. There's no bond between this ethylene or ethene or ethylene and this ethylene. But if one electron came here and the other one flew somewhere else, and then one electron came here and the other one flew somewhere else, you would be able to make this. Now there's the first what we had before, Miss H. There's the first ethene, right? This is the new pair of electrons making this bond, single bond. And then you have the ethene again from the second ethene. And I'll just put this one electron here. So if you had one electron go here and one electron go here. This is called homolytic cleavage. But homolytic cleavage, if you have one go in one direction, the other go in the other direction, this one goes here, this one goes here. We'll talk about him in a minute. When these two get into the center, they make a bond, which would just be a straight bond. But the truth is, if you've got a bottle of ethylene, let's say you had a bottle of ethylene, of course, it would have to be extremely cold because it would be a gas. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. It's the gas that turns fruit ripe, if you're wondering. Okay, so if you have a bottle of ethylene at an extremely cold temperature because it would be a gas, it's not going to automatically do this. But if it had an initiator added to it, and we have to explain what an initiator is, something that does a free radical reaction. OK, um, we use solid rocket fuel. We probably use like benzoyl peroxide, which you might have heard of for skin and acne. But you don't need to know what the initiator. But what you do need to know is the monomer ethylene could make a bond here. But this electron could go to another ethylene. Who's minding his own business. And you can make a bond here, and pretty soon you'd have a long, 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 long chain of carbons. So how would we write this one? Brackets. 
brackets repeating thousands of times. If you had this, it's nothing but a straight chain of carbons, it would be this. And let me just do something with that. One carbon's a gas, methane, ethane, propane, butane, still a gas, pentane, it's heavy enough to be a liquid, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. If you go a lot of times, you got a solid plastic. Yeah, it could be a solid wax, but either way, a solid long, long, long chain. This piece of plastic is nothing but long chains of carbon going up and down, up and down, up and down, with other things in it, this one, I'm sure. Now, if you had this, it would be named after the monomer. That's a single bond, so it's technically a polyene, but because it came from an ethylene, this is polyethylene. And I would write this and this and run to the right the formula for polyethylene. I might give you the formula for polyethylene and you have to say, what if I took this out? That would be the monomer. So look for the monomer in it. Like if somebody were to say, here's the structure of polyethylene, what monomer made it? You might know the word, or here's a structure. I'm not gonna tell you the name of this polymer, what monomer made it. Well, it's this monomer, the same as that monomer, but put a double bond back in it. And you could see it's an ethylene that made it. I hope you could do that. We'll do more. So anyway, there's your ethyl and polyethylene. It's an addition polymer because it adds up different monomers. Now, with that in mind, a lot of old names here. This guy. A long time ago, well, no, you know records. Records we call vinyl, right? You didn't know records for a while, but you decided to bring records back in your generation. So, rec or maybe whatever watch, whatever year you're watching, this somebody knows records. So, records are, to make a long story short, made of something called vinyl. A long time ago, we called double bonds vinyl. So. When I was a child in the 1970s, uh, you put vinyl on couches, and it was a horrific thing to sleep on, but vinyl slip covers, okay? But now you think of vinyl records more than anything. So this was a vinyl chloride. Now it's a uh, chloroethylene in some respects, but let's say it was called a vinyl chloride. Here's another vinyl chloride. show the polymer being made. Let's say there was an initiator in there. Well, first, go in this direction, go in this direction, and now carbon HH, carbon, that second guy's got a chlorine on it. So you've got an H, but now you have Cl. Now you are up to here, carbon HH, the second guy's got a chlorine on it, and now you're done thousands of times. If this is ethylene, it makes polyethylene. If this was vinyl chloride, it makes polyvinyl chloride. D-I-N-Y-L. We call this PVC. So I hope in your life you might have heard of a PVC pipe. It can hold water, it's pretty rigid. Polyethylene, well, I don't know, can I find myself some polyethylene? Okay, I found some polyethylene. See, plastic. A plastic bag would be polyethylene. Depending on what you got, depends uh, on what you got hanging off of it, uh, is going to change the properties of the final product. Polyvinyl chloride and a plastic pipe is different. Okay, I'll show you a different one. I should have left that up. I could have made a point. And the next one I will. Let's say I have, can you read my addition polymer thing here? 
let's say I have this, the backbone. But now I have a benzene ring. So here's another one, the backbone. But now I have a benzene ring. Make the polymer. You say, okay, same thing's going to be here. You're going to have C, 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 C straight for these addition polymers. They're all going to say thousands of times. They're going to have different things bonded to them. In this case, I've got hydrogens. The second one's going to have to be a benzene ring, then a hydrogen, then a benzene ring. This is styrene. So this would be polystyrene. So let's see if I can spell. Or S-T-R-Y-O-F-O-A-M. Styrofoam. Okay, good. What properties does PVC pipe have? Because of chlorine, it's hard to make a pipe out of it. What properties do styrofoam have? They're fluffy. It's, it's something used for packing materials, but it's not going to go anywhere in nature. It's used for packing materials, not going to go anywhere. Now, like you would think of packing peanuts. Saddest thing, my God, you poor generation. First of all, you stay in your cars and you leave them on so you could like have a world in there because you're out there with your phones and that's how that's part of your house now. Okay, you're heating your cars. That was a new thing. We used to always turn our cars off. But secondly, you always went shopping for things, but now you have things delivered to your house. So many more styrofoam packing peanuts are packing your things that you get from Amazon and everything else. And maybe they have less packing material, maybe they have more packing material, it depends. But people often want packing peanuts that would dissolve in water. Now, styrofoam is not going to dissolve in water. But if you're curious, there are biodegradable packing peanuts. Now, biodegradable means dissolves or breaks up with life. The bio in this case is bacteria. We need bacteria. Bacteria needs the sun, bacteria needs uh, the rain, it needs air and things like that. It's a living creature, but to make a long story short, it can break up things for us, okay? It gives off a bad smell quite often. So what would a biodegradable packing peanut be? You've seen them. They don't look like packing peanuts, and if you ate them, they taste like a weird bread, okay? But the packing, don't you? But if you put them in the sink, you could wash them down the drain, because what would be a biodegradable polymer? Starch. They just use starch to make packing peanuts. That's kind of an interesting thing they do. Take a bunch of rice and make packing peanuts that are fluffed up at it, and you're in good shape. Okay, so now let's try something else. I got vinyl chloride, I got styrene. Polyvinyl chloride makes a hard, rigid material, styrene makes a fluffy styrofoam. Let's say I mix. 80%, no better yet, 30% of my styrene, but over here for the second guy, I'll put a chlorine, and let's make it 70% vinyl chloride. Now, there's going to be a lot more vinyl chloride, so you're going to have a lot of these C, 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 L, C, 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 L, C, 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 L, then you would have C, benzene, C, benzene. But if we just mix these together as a copolymer and we change the ratios based on what we want, let's put a chlorine here, because now we have carbon with two hydrogens and a carbon with a benzene, then carbon with two hydrogens and a carbon with a chlorine. In this case, what would you have? Well, it's a polymer. It's an addition polymer, but it's going to take on the properties of styrofoam and the properties of vinyl chloride. If it's a lot more vinyl chloride, it might be a slightly 
fluffy, hard material. So maybe you don't want a very, very, very rigid uh, pipe. Maybe you wanted a slightly fluffy pipe, a pipe that takes up more room but is still hard. If you made 90% vinyl chloride and 10% styrene, it would have a little less fluff to it. If you made it 70% styrene and probably only 30% vinyl chloride, it'd be a packing peanut that's a little hard. You'd wonder why you even made it, okay? But it'd be very fluffy. So that's what's nice about it. Remember I talked about it originally in the last lecture from this last hour. This is one class with two lectures. Um, when you had uh, the need for new things, you did two metals together in the early 1900s. You made an alloy. You took a heavy metal and a light metal and you tried to make a space age alloy. But now, oh, you can make anything. You can make this pen. I want this pen cap to be a little squishy. I want this to be more rigid, polypropylene, uh, things like that. They're all different names. So I do want you to be able to take these two and make the addition polymer. But I want you to know that why copolymers are important. Because you can take the properties of different polymers and just make the perfect thing. You can make a bulletproof light shield to put on something. It's amazing what you can do with plastics. And it all comes from the Saudi Arabian oil or wherever you get your oil from. Okay, so I want to talk about the next thing. Go back to my ethylene. Here's two forms of ethylene. One, 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 like that. So in this case, straight chains and they stack tightly. If they stack tightly, you can make polyethylene that's very dense. E T H Y L E N E, but it's very dense. You could make a high density polyethylene. If you had a polyethylene, and this is probably more of your plastic bags. That'd be like a milk jug. And every so often you have some branches on the chain. They can't stack very tightly. This would be not very dense. This would be not dense. So this is low density. Let me write it down here. Low density poly ethylene. That becomes important in your life. It depends on what state you're in. Of uh, my dad, my mom, my dad couldn't read uh, to make a long story short. He's an old farmer, but he was in New Jersey, a state that they taxed you like you would not believe. My entire life, my parents were saying, get out of New Jersey, get out of New Jersey, whatever you do, get out of New Jersey. I went to Montana. You can dump any model you want into the water in a lot of the Montana because if you can't grow it, you got to mine it. So environmental laws are incredibly different. In New Jersey, what I'm getting to, they have you not just recycle. They have you separate your recycling based on the type of plastic. And my elderly parents, my dad couldn't read, et cetera, but boy, he could look at a plastic bottle and figure out exactly what type of plastic it was and put it in different containers. And how did they make you do that? They opened up your garbage bag, and if they saw in your garbage bag you had recyclables, they'd find you. they find you for everything on the East Coast. That's just the way the East Coast is. So on the bottle, how does my dad see it? Arrow, arrow. Now, in the old days, students would say in my class, I know what that is. That's that triangle on the bottom of plastic bottles. Boy, nobody looks anymore. Maybe with the social media, you don't look as much. But if you've ever looked, or you can, look in the bottom of your plastic bottles, they'd be like PTFEHDPE. It tells the person who's recycling exactly what type of bottle it is. 
And like in Kentucky, you can recycle if you want to. If you don't want to, no one's going to fine you. But people do recycle in Kentucky. But we put everything on our recycle bins. We put uh, paper and we put glass and we put plastics. Someone has to separate that. You sell your plastic recycling or your recycling bins to another country and the poorest people's families open up your bag for you and separate it for you. Okay, so it's not like it's a magical thing that a machine can do. So much is done by human beings in this world, it's kind of not even funny. Okay, so anyway, I do want you to realize that there's rigid plastics. This is rigid. This is amorphous. Either way, they're not going to go away in the environment. How will a person get rid of these things? Come on, you know something I'm going to tell you. But first, I want to do one more of these addition columns. I erase quickly, but I know you can stop your camera as you're taking notes. And now I know you're taking notes. It's the only way I'm going to make sure you watch your lectures right now. All right. C, but an F, but an F, double bond, F, F. Here's another one. No hydrogens at all. F, F, double bond, C, F, F. So it's uh, ethylene with four fluorines, mono, di, tri, tetra, okay? So this is a tetra fluoro. Ethylene. Oh, I can do it this way. I'm doing this on purpose. There you go. It's a tetra fluoro ethylene. It's four fluorines on a ethylene. Let's put it together. Here we go. Line the backbone, carbons. Thousands of times. F, F. If you remember my talk with insecticides, chlorines, your body can't do anything with it. It's a very unreactive bond with a carbon to a chlorine, very unreactive carbon to a fluorine. I talked about CFCs. They're so unreactive, they go all the way to the upper atmosphere. And in the upper atmosphere, they finally break down and they hurt the ozone layer because they're so unreactive. To make a long story short, what is this? Well, if I had my class here, having written it this way, my students would say T, oh, I gotta put capital E here. There you go. Tetrafluoroethylene. Teflon. Oh, now I gotta put an N. I know. See, never done this before this way. There you go. Hopefully you can see Teflon. What is Teflon? It's used completely non-stick pans. Now, if you have a Teflon pan, people often say, well, how do they get the Teflon to stick to the pan? You can set this up to where you put some things that tie it to the metal. Don't worry about that, okay? It's something that grabs it. But once you get that Teflon lining, nothing's going to break through that. Unless you're using metal spatulas with a Teflon pan, and then you beat it up. And if you see a Teflon pan that um, has all these etches in it, somebody ate all of that. Okay, with the, it's not going to hurt them though, because it's a completely, well, I'm not saying you should eat Teflon, but you do eat plastic, you'd be surprised. Like if you took Metamucil, a fiber laxative, that's something that's plant based. But if you take something called Miralax, if you are at home and you look at Miralax and you pour it and you'll say, this is powdered plastic, <laughs> okay? It does its job, Miralax, as a laxative, but either way, there are some so non-reactive plastics you could eat them. Yeah, you shouldn't eat stuff like that. You don't have to. Okay, I'm not saying Miralax is a bad product. It's probably fine. All right, so that guy, we thought Teflon's talk was kind of good. He's a quick addition polymer for me to cover. Here's another guy who's interesting. Now, this is a natural addition polymer. We didn't know we were making an addition polymer. This is when we just got lucky. 
But this molecule, molecule, hopefully you can see why it can make an addition polymer. CH2 brackets straight down, no brackets, to a double bond C. No, no, let's do it this way. CH2 double bond C, C double bond CH2, H CH3. This is called ISO pre movement. Okay. What can this do? This can basically do an addition polymer with this and not with that one. So if you have thousands of these, and I'm not going to make you draw this, but hopefully you can see this CH2, C double bond C, CH2, CH2, C double bond C, CH2, H, CH3, H, CH3. You can start making addition links. You can get isoprene in the form of something from a rubber tree. Rubber trees have sap, etc. Um, most of my analogies from 30 years ago don't work anymore, but uh, you had the ant with high hopes who would try to push down the rubber tree plant. It was a song, high hopes. Okay, so anyway, the what makes the ant think he can push down a rubber tree plant? He's really, really interested in doing that. Now, rubber can't be used directly to make tires. You can't like use a rubber glove and call it a tire. It's got an issue, okay? It needs to be much more rigid than that. It needs to be much more rigid than that. So, with that in mind, imagine long chains of this stuff. When you see movies about hell, they talk of a sulfur smell. People take a little bit of history and they throw it into all these movies. So you see like Supernatural, there's one TV show that lasted for way too long. Those brothers got extremely old, but they always talk about a sulfur smell. Well, people thought of like hell as being like the inside of a volcano. And when a volcano was spewing out the inside of the world, there was a lot of H2S gas coming off and it smelled like rotten eggs and sulfur. Okay, so they somehow in history for tens of thousands of years, they've tied the smell of sulfur to hot uh, lava and hell. Okay. And there was gods, and there was a god of this kind of stuff, and a lot of times you think of a word named Vulcan, okay? Vulcan was hot in, in Star Trek, but either way, this is going to be called Vulcanization of rubber. If you take some sulfurs and you mix it with rubber, you can cross-link and make rigid. So you can make a tire. And the person who did this was Charles Goodyear. For Goodyear tires, maybe that's an analogy for you, maybe it's not. But to take rubber and cross-link it with sulfur, you're adding sulfur to it. Now, when people in this world are upset with a government that doesn't just shoot them all and they have to hide from, there's governments that don't just shoot you and there's governments that just shoot you where everybody has to hide and horrible things happen, okay? So if you're in a country where they're not just all shooting you and you're extremely poor and you've burned every tree down on your island, 
a lot of times the last thing people will do when they're rioting, trying to get the attention of the government, is to burn tires. Why? Because <laughs> when you burn tires, you put this thick black smoke that smells horrible because of the sulfur. If you're wondering, and it's always so sad, the last thing people will do when there's nothing else to burn, they'll burn tires, and they keep tires for that particular reason, uh, for stuff like that. Okay, so with that in mind, that was a good example of a natural, um, almost natural condensation polymer. But how do we get rid of polymers? We talk about getting rid of plastics. How do we get rid of anything? Uh, I grew up on a farm. My property, my dad's property, five acres. There was a chicken coop on it, and we grew up in this chicken coop. There was nine of us. I was the last of nine. Interesting place. It's as long as Pasture Hall, and it was very low ground in New Jersey, but it was like a swamp area. We threw our garbage in this particular garbage pit. And we never had to cap it or anything. It never filled in my entire life. For all the family, I was the last of nine children. My parents started having kids in the 1940s, and they had me in the 19, early 1960s. So getting past that, why was an open pit? So an open dump works. Well, to degrade most things. Now, when we went to a store, a bottle of soda was extremely heavy because it was made of glass. We had paper. Plastics weren't happening that much. They were happening um, in the 1940s with Bakelite and things like that, some of those cheap, horrible, crappy plastics. At some point, you got to the stage uh, where you had plastics being used for everything, but it wasn't used for everything for quite some time. An open dump is going to have sunlight, it's going to have air, so it's going to have O2, N2, and it's going to have water. So what can happen? Major biodegradation. D-E-G-R-E-D-A-T-I-O-M. Aside from, okay, you'll have rats and mice. Aside from the rats and mice eating your big hunks of food that you've left over, you have major biodegradation. But people don't like open dumps anymore. Mostly because they don't like the smell. They don't like an open dump in their area. Nobody likes an open dump. They don't like the smell. What we do today are landfills. Now, we worry about the water table. There's water running through the rocks. It's not like an underground river with magical people or anything. There's water just seeping through the earth. You can take a well and go down there and get that water quite often. We don't want anything leaching. We don't want leaching. What does that say, Dr. Stinsky? I can't read it. L-E-A-C-H-I-N-G. We don't want leaching of poisons into the water table. So the first thing they do is they line it on the bottom, but they're not lining it with plastics. If you take limestone and clay and grind it up with limestone and clay, you can make like a cement type thing. So just some rocks can be pretty much impermeable to water. Then we fill with garbage bags. All the people in the town for years, at some point, we put a cap, solid, and then we have a layer of rocks that water can run through, and then we have grass and soil, S-O-I-L, and then we play baseball, so we have a park on top. You don't want to live on top of a landfill. So it's a green space at the end, and it doesn't smell like anything. It was a great, they didn't have to have this horrible, horrible smell. We are sealing our garbage. How do we want to get rid of plastics? Well, plastics fill landfills. So let's talk about disposal of plastics with an eye on the idea of an open dump 
and the eye of an idea on a landfill. First of all, what can you do? Well, for disposal of plastics, of course you can make less and use less. But apparently right now we're going to use every bit of plastic we got. We'll all get it from Saudi Arabia oil, right? So you say, first, make biodegradable. My PhD is in environmental chemistry, okay? So I understand a little bit of this. Biodegradable. You have a long chain, but every so often, it's not an oxygen. Every so often, you put something, a bacteria can eat. If you buy, I'm going to go back to my one crop for today. Oh, I'll use a different one. Okay. If you buy a biodegradable plastic bag, oh look, there's those arrows for it recycle. You spend money on a biodegradable plastic bag. You spend extra money because it's been made special to have something that will degrade it, break it up. Now, in the 1960s, when we first started making plastic bags, people wanted a hefty, a strong bag. They would laugh that you would make a biodegradable bag and be proud to use it. Because if you have a biodegradable bag that's really biodegradable, and you shove a lot of stuff in it, the thing's going to break sometimes by the time you get to the trash can. But you do it because it's the right thing to do. You say to yourself, you know something, I'll just put less stuff in it. I'm not going to shove it as much because I want to have something that degrades in the environment. What are you doing with your plastic bag? You're putting it in a time capsule. You could open up in 4,000 years any of our landfills. Open up that plastic bag and read your mail. That's <laughs> not going to go anywhere, okay? So to make a long story short, we do weird things. I'm not saying you shouldn't do biodegradable stuff, but it only works if you have a dump with like air and water and, and, uh, and sun and all these things that bacteria need. So we're kind of strange on this planet, okay, that we do a lot of things like this. But yes, you can buy biodegradable materials. I don't know where they're supposed to biodegrade, but, well, you do. That would be a, a solution to making less plastic, you get rid of it, or using less pla having plastic that gets used up. Next would be an incinerator. Hazardous waste incinerator. If you burn something, you'll have nothing but the dust left, and it'll fly away as a gas. It's carbon dioxide and water is wood in that respect, paper. Now, in the 1970s, we had a lot of hazardous waste incinerators. Well, we tried to build a lot of these. And they have strict, S-T-R-I-C-T, government rules. Because you've got waste. You've got to take the powder that comes out of it at the end. You've got to do something with it. But with a hazardous waste incinerator, let's say you have fire on the bottom here, you can't allow toxic stuff to get into the air because you're actually getting rid of something. So you have these strong EPA laws, which means you have to have scrubbers and filters, and each one of these scrubbers and filters, when they get filled, become a waste as well, and they need to be buried somewhere. So it, it's an expensive thing to do, but you could get pretty clean air out of them. Now, that makes sense. Let's talk about making cement. If you make cement, I'll get some things. Let's say you have like some limestone, clay. It's all powdered up and you have a big flame inside of it. You're making cement and you have this you have this big flame inside of it and on the bottom, and it's a process called clinkering. I'm not doing this, but you have to make a complete dusty, 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 dusty ground up powder. So when a person mixes it back with water, it makes cement. 
if you take cement and put sand and rocks in it, you make concrete, if you're wondering, okay? It doesn't really crack the same way. But let's say you're making cement. It's an expensive thing, but it's also a big flame. This is a production progress, uh, process. It has less strict rules for what it can actually make as pollution. With the hazardous waste incinerator, you would just burn the hazardous waste. With this one, you have to burn fuel to make the fire to heat up the cement clay. If you put a hole here and you dump in hazardous waste, then you could have a cement plant that's burning hazardous waste, and they could say the hazardous waste burns, it gives off heat, that's a fuel for us. So they don't have to follow the EPA rules, and they really messed up the hazardous waste incinerator companies, because these people are able to follow less rules. To make a long story short, the companies who do this, you know, if you think about it, the powder of the hazardous waste ends up getting locked up in cement. That's not the worst thing, but there's gases that come out of it. And if you talk to a company, a company will go out of its way to say that um, we are under the legal limit, according to a process plant, to how much gases we put out and how bad they are. If we were hazardous waste incinerated, we'd have to put more scrubbers here. Let's say it was extremely cheap to put scrubbers there. And to do the right thing, you feel like you should put something that's going, a scrubber is something that catches dirt, okay? Put some more filters and scrubbers. The company will say, if the level is 60 that I have to do, and the level for the hazardous weights incinerator is 30 of whatever, as long as I'm under 60, I'm not going to put scrubbers. And if you say to these people, but what if the scrubbers were so cheap, you could go down to 30 and not spend any more money? The, gov the companies, smartly so, sadly, will say, no, we're not going to put scrubbers. Because if we put scrubbers, we're admitting that this might be a problem and we'll open ourselves up to lawsuits. So what companies end up doing is exactly as much as the law says and nothing more, okay? If you're wondering about that. So an incinerator is not gonna burn all the world's plastic. Finally, you can recycle. Let's talk about recycle. Recycle plastic bottles. Or let's say you recycle, so I'll look for a plastic bottle. There must be one here. <laughs> okay, good. So this person wants to recycle this plastic bottle. It has a number on it somewhere, but I'll never see it. It just has a picture with the plastic on it. And I shouldn't look anymore because you're like, please, Dr. Sinsky, finish. Okay, plastic bottle. This came from a liquid that was polymerized by an addition polymer. Okay, system where you had this thing that started it. You can chop this up. You'll never make this a liquid again. So what would you do with this? You chop up and make a park bench. That's a good example. One of the few examples. You chop it up, glue it together, you make a park bench. You'll know, or maybe some fencing. You sit on one of these things and you're like, what's wrong with this park bench? It seems to have all this crap coming off of it, okay? It's coming off because it's glued together pieces of plastic bottles, all right? They think about using them for, uh, they're trying very hard. Think about using it as a powder uh, for maybe insulation, et cetera. But to make a long story short, recycling this stuff, it's not like I can ever make another plastic bottle from it. I can't. Okay, that should be important for you to realize. Disposal of plastics is really important for people. So with that in mind, it's been another 50 minutes and that takes care of the plastics chapter. So the organics chapter had one big lecture, the plastics chapter has one big two hour lecture. Thank you for your time. <sighs> I shouldn't sigh, I know, I sigh too much. I hear that.